You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. We're all very aware of what conflict is uh, because we have lived some time Um, different times on the earth and conflict is a feature of our lives every day and this evening um, we are going to think about first of all very briefly what conflict is and then how the world deals with conflict and then we're going to think about different ways in which the bible deals with different conflicts situations where conflict arises and ultimately we're going to think a little bit about uh, the biggest conflict that exists for humans. So conflict we can define then as uh, as the outcome or, or the result of when two parties or two groups or two individuals, two peoples, um, things that they want to do, their outcomes, are incompatible. You can't meet You can't resolve, neither both parties' desires to do something uh, together, um, uh, when you put them together, cannot be realised. And therefore there is, when one party or the other party tries to assert what they want to do over the other person's, there is a conflict that arises. And there are all kinds of different types of, of conflict, and that very basic scenario of a single or multiple parties different desires to do what they want to do we see in interpersonal conflicts in conflicts in the home in um, polite disagreements or in arguments or in litigation and going to law with one another ultimately with war all of these are where the different groups are wanting to do something and they can't do what they want to do because it clashes against what somebody or some some other group wants to do and conflict arises and there was a couple I think they are um, psychiatrists or psychologists or or something like that there was a a a couple of um, academics Thomas and uh, Kilman who have come up with the Thomas Kilman model for which outlines all of the different approaches that anyone can take to dealing with conflict so how can you respond when there is a, a conflict situation And the Thomas Kilman model outlines five different ways in which you can respond when there is a conflict situation. And the first one is to avoid conflict. So something happens, you come into conflict, your uh, desires or wants or the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve conflict, you seek to just get out of the situation, you avoid it, you remove yourself or the presence of that conflict. The second is to accommodate. So that is you continue in that present kind of situation, but you allow your, your own desires or whatever your outcomes that you're trying to achieve to be removed or to be reduced and allow the other persons to, um, to, uh, to continue and to realise what they want to do. So you can accommodate the other person's um, uh, outcomes. You can compromise. So you can come together as both parties and you can have a discussion and both of you will not quite get exactly what you want to get, but both of you, both of the parties will get something um, or uh, be able to realise some of, of what they're after. Um, you can compete. So you can assert to assert your own outcomes and the other party's outcomes will uh, suffer because of it and that incompatibility is going to be, um, is, is going to, uh, they're going to fall foul of your competitiveness in that situation. Or you can collaborate. So both parties together can come together and you can try to realise there is a way here that we can resolve the situation so that we can both get exactly what we want out of this situation through coming to some um, agreement about, about how this is going to work. And there are two characteristics that the Thomas Kilman model outlines which are applied in different levels depending upon which strategy you are adopting. So there is assertiveness 
and uh, then there is cooperativeness. And if you were going to be particularly competitive in that in your model, then you would be uh, you would display the character of assertiveness, and you would have low levels of cooperativeness. Um, and if you were going to accommodate, then you would, for example, have high levels of cooperativeness and low levels of assertiveness. So. This is some of the thinking, this is a pattern, a model, which describes the different approaches in any conflict situation that uh, we can adopt. Now, if we, so that's a kind of a, a, an abstract model for dealing with conflict, which then can be applied to lots of different, conf different situations. When we think just briefly about the world of business, there are different ways then, if there are conflicts between different businesses that there that conflict can be resolved and at one end of the scale there is litigation so one business can seek to assert through law the outcomes that they are seeking to do they feel that their rights have been broken in some way and so they will say well we're going to invoke law and we're going to realize uh, everything that we want to do um, and uh, and ass assert our rights because that is what we're going to do and it's generally understood that that kind of um, aggressive approach to dealing with conflict is perhaps in business not always the most efficient way of businesses working out their problems or the conflicts they have between one another. And so where there is conflicts, what another approach would be to bring in a mediator. And a mediator will sit as a third party, an independent third party, and speak to the two different groups that are trying to work something out, and they will, um, they will suggest a solution that then may or may not be um, uh, agreed upon by those two businesses. And then a kind of in-between is arbitration. So again, a third party, an independent third party, will come along, but they will be a little bit, they will perhaps have the ability to enforce a decision on the basis, uh, to make a decision on behalf of the discussions that are happening. And sometimes and that is legally enforceable and sometimes it isn't. So there are different strategies then generally, Thomas Kilmer model, there's different strategies within business. And there are different ways or approaches that the world has gone about seeking to resolve or seeking to deal with conflict on an international scale, which is the most extreme version of conflict, which is war. Um, so after the First World War, it was believed, generally, that because different countries were more dependent upon each other there was in, in terms of their economies, and because there was generally rational leadership within each of the, the countries of the world, that it was unlikely that there was going to be another great war in the same way, because it just doesn't make sense. It isn't worth having that kind of conflict. But despite that, there were some things that happened after the First World War, um, some laws that were made to make certain wars or, or, um, uh, illegal and to, to kind of seek to put things in place um, that, um, that, that, uh, that, that stopped this thing happening again. And then, of course, it didn't work. So you've got the Second World War, and so after the Second World War, there were more institutions. There were things like the United Nations that were established, UNESCO that was established, the uh, International Monetary Fund. So there's economic and legal and kind of international organisations which were established to say these, this conflict international conflict war is uh, is a problem it is uh, it is not a good thing and uh, and therefore let's stop it and it was in the 70s and 80s then uh, that during the cold war the I, the discipline of conflict resolution really took off because there was a recognition within academia and within governments that there was great value in thinking about how to develop different ways of dealing with conflict. And so conflict resolution as an academic discipline um, begin to take off in universities and courses that you could go and study and institutions which were devoted to dealing with conflict. And it hasn't really worked um, because you know, we're all aware, aren't we, of um, of lots of different conflicts in the world, and particularly Russia I invading uh, the Ukraine. So wars still occur. This extreme version of conflict still occur. And in our day-to-day -day lives, there are still conflicts. I imagine that most of us, in some way, 
shape or form have probably experienced a conflict today and probably will uh, tomorrow. So conflict then generally is something that we live with individually, internationally. What does the Bible say about dealing with conflict then? Well, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3. Because Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3 describes for us the first and, as we will see, the most fundamental of conflicts between man's desired outcomes and God's. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3, God stipulated in verse 1 that ye shall not eat of every tree um, of the garden. Uh, well, it's the certain actually said that, but God had, God had said it previously. So um, the Lord God, well, let's read from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And... The woman sees in verse 6 this tree, it's good for food, it's pleasant, and she takes of it and she eats it, and so does Adam. And we've got there the first conflict, really, between God's desire for man to be obedient and man's desire to do what they want to do and to satisfy, in this case, the lusts of uh, the flesh, um, to satisfy, to do what they want uh, to do. And the conflict then results in man and God previously being together, now being separated. A man is thrust out of the garden towards the end of that chapter. And there is this great divide then, which is established between man and in his sin and God in his righteousness. It's a conflict then that for the rest of the pages of our Bible, uh, God seeks to find or establishes a solution for now, it's in Genesis chapter 4, the next chapter, that we have another conflict, a very severe conflict, where one brother, because of his desire to be accepted by God and his desire for his brothers uh, and his jealousy uh, for, of, of his brother, um, kills him. We won't go into the details of that, but just to note that Genesis chapter what? Genesis chapter 3, we've got a great conflict between man and God. Genesis chapter 4, we have the first conflict which results in murder, a brother killing another bro uh, uh, his brother. And by the time we get to Genesis um, chapter 10, um, we, have, um, uh, we have wars occurring. And, uh, and so we could see that very early in our Bibles, we're introduced to all kinds of different conflicts, fundamental conflicts between man and God, conflicts between, within families, conflicts between different groups and nations. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 13, because we read together then, here is an example of how conflict might be resolved. And the issue that we see in Genesis chapter 13, the problem here is that there is not enough room for the flocks of Abraham and the flocks of Lot to exist together. There is, uh, there is, a, um, there is an issue here that um, needs to be resolved, and that issue before it develops into something more severe is removed because Abraham takes the initiative here and he solves this conflict between the, the incompatibility between the coexistence of one group of flocks and another group of flocks and a sparse set of resources by saying to Lot, well, Lot, let's separate. So this is kind of an avoidance conflict strategy, we might say, and let's separate and Lot, you go you, you select where you want and what you want, and Abraham allows uh, Lot to select um, first, and Lot cho chooses the plain of Jordan, and Abraham stays in the land. And so there is an element of selflessness here on, on, on Abraham's behalf, um, 
which removes, which dissolves this conflict which could have, which was present and, then, uh, and could have escalated. So that's one example. Another example is if we just turn on a few uh, passages. Let's, let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. Because in Leviticus chapter 24, arguably we've got quite an interesting kind of way of resolving conflict or, or potential conflict. Uh, if we read in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 19, if a man cause a blemish in his neighbour as he hath done, so it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. If, and he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. He, ye shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger, as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. So there are two ways in which we could suggest that this is removing conflict. If you've done something where you've accidentally done something or purposefully done something to your friend or your neighbor, um, then it will be done to you, even up to the point of killing them. If you kill a person, then you will be put to death. And we could we'd suggest that this is removing in some way a conflict in that it puts in place an equivalence, doesn't it? A, um, a, a type of justice which is quite extreme and extremely equivalent between something happens, it happens to you. There is nothing else that should happen after that. That this is dealt with and it is fair. And there is another way in which we could see this as being a, um, a prevention of a conflict or, or, or a res resolution to a conflict in that it prevents it, doesn't it? It's, it provides a, a clear and understandable response. If, this, if you do this, then this is going to happen and therefore don't, uh, and then don't do this. Um, there is a consequence here which, is made, which people are made through the law very aware of. So here is another, you might suggest, a, a strategy for a type of resolving, solving conflicts which is written into the law of God. Let's turn to our New Testament and let's look at another example, which is in Acts chapter 15. Because that example in Leviticus is in some ways quite harsh, isn't it? It's quite um, absolute and black and white. Um, but the way in which the, the, the conflict is, is dealt with in Acts chapter 15 is, is a little bit different. And the problem here is that as the church begins to grow, as more and more disciples become uh, baptised and, the, and the, the knowledge of Christ expands, there is, an, a, there is a difference of opinion or there is a, an issue between different groups um, within the, the ecclesia of those that are baptised. And some of those that are baptised are Gentiles and some of those that are baptised are Jews. And although the Jews have accepted Christ, the Jewish elements have accepted Christ, in this chapter, one of the issues that arises is that the Jewish members of a meeting, of an ecclesia, have also clung on to aspects of the law. And they have amalgamated their understanding of what it is to be in Christ with what they were previously under the law of Moses. And they've said that actually that kind of amalgamation of these two things should also be imposed upon the Gentiles and that they should follow parts of the law as well as living in Christ. And that conflicts then with the Gentiles' view that actually they shouldn't have to follow the law. they have not part of the law, they're free from the law, or any believer that just had this understanding and there was a conflict here and it was a conflict which was proving extremely severe within um within the churches and what was the what is the um the solution to this well in acts chapter 15 and, and the particular point here in acts chapter 15 is that the aspect of the law that was required is that those that were had accepted christ jew or gentile had to be circumcised and the solution here comes in verse th from verse 13. So they listen to the different parties discussing, uh, and then after they have held their peace, an apostle, a spirit-guided elder, stands up, James, and says, Men and brethren, 
Hearken, listen to me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and to agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And he outlines then the fact that the Gentiles have been brought in to the uh, to being in a position of um, of in Christ and then and as uh, as a consequence part of an adopted family of Israel. But he goes on and he says, "My sentence in verse nineteen is the resolution, the way in which we're going to." resolve this conflict is that we don't trouble them which from among the gentiles are turned to god but to be circumcised we don't impose upon them this thing which is unnecessary but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication from things strangled and from blood for moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every sabbath day then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole ecclesia to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch and they write letters and they explain this thing and uh, the, the solution that they've come to and the solution is, well, we are actually going to reflect that the Gentiles have clearly been brought in. We know that they have been brought in to the faith of uh, Israel and that we are not going to require them. There is nothing that requires them um, to be circumcised, but we are going to ask them to do certain things which seem to be, in some ways, a, um, some of these things, a, a, a compromised position or a sympathetic, perhaps is a better way of putting it, a sympathetic position to the Jewish elements, particularly that last part that they should abstain from things strangled and from blood. So there is here an acceptance of the of the things which are particularly offensive to the Jewish elements. There is a level of compromise here which is being uh, described, but ultimately there is no need for them to be circumcised. Let's just look at, uh, let's look at another um, example, which is in Matthew chapter 18. Because in that situation that we saw, there was a... a Spirit-guided elder stood up and made a pronouncement, discussed, understood as an ecclesia. They came together, they thought about what was right, and there was a decision made by someone who had that authority to make that decision, and which was a position which was sympathetic to both parties involved. Matthew chapter 18, here uh, is uh, Mark. Um, Matthew chapter 18 is interesting because... Here is a solution to resolving a conflict which exists between two brethren. If one brother does something against another brother and that brother that's had something done to him feels that he has, um, it, that a wrong has been done, well, really, this is a conflict between the brethren, but ultimately it's a conflict between the brother that has done something wrong and God. And the way in which this conflict is to be resolved is that there is a process that is established. And we know that this passage is dealing with really the spirit of this is about stopping the conflict that exists between a man that's done something wrong to God because of the context, which is talking about sheep going astray. It's talking of, which is, is talking about sinners um, and the way in which, if there are 99, does God care that one sinner has gone astray? Yes, and every effort is to be made to bring them back. And here, really, we've got a description of a process which is to be followed, to seek to make every effort to bring someone back. Um, and, that, uh, and that starts with a conversation between those two brethren where that issue has occurred. And that's quite a, a sensible, rational thing, isn't it, to suggest that it's the least, it's the least difficult for that brother to, uh, to deal with, potentially, that you go as an individual and you speak to them and you try to point out what it is that you've done. And then if that doesn't work, then you go with two or three others so that you kind of are able to bring in other people's views and perceptions to have that discussion with that brother. And then if that doesn't work, then you take the authority of the entire ecclesia and ultimately that person is put out because they need to have um, some kind of 
position which is clear to them that it is unacceptable and they can't continue in that trespass, in that issue, if they do this thing. But the aim here is to bring them back. So here is a conflict between man and God, and the, what is really being attempted here is to make every effort to bring that stray sheep back into the fold. So here is another uh, attempt to resolve conflict. Let's just go to one more before we think about a final, the final conflict. So if we go back to Matthew chapter 5, because we saw in Leviticus chapter 24 that the law was quite harsh, wasn't it? It was quite... Um, black and white about the way in which there was a response to issues. But here, Christ takes and changes that attitude. Um, and in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38, there is a very different approach to conflict, which is very much, if we were to take the Thomas Kilmer model, uh, it, it is very much... Um, the, the removal of oneself from conflict or the acceptance of conflict, the, uh, the, the acceptance that a person can assert their right even over your own person. And there is a whole um, set of teachings that run throughout scriptures about suffering persecution and accepting your position and not only accepting but rejoicing in your position when people look and think, I do not like the fact that you have accepted Christ. That is, a, that is an issue to my way of life and my way of thinking. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to hurt you and ultimately to kill you. That is a conflict. And the, the way in which that conflict is resolved is an acceptance on behalf of the believer. That is the attitude, a meek and a humble acceptance. And so we read here, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, verse 38, but Christ says that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat. Uh, let him have thy cloak also. So here is a, just a couple of verses. And we could go to hundreds others of others which speak about this attitude of a believer in Christ and the way in which they resolve conflict they accept it they, they allow the other person to assert themselves over um, and they seek peace and that peace could be at the cost of the things that they want to do or their, their, even their existence recognising that ultimately God is the one that's going to resolve these particular types of conflicts <coughs> so we we bring our thoughts kind of to a close then, just by thinking about the final conflict, which is, <clears throat> which described for us in Genesis chapter 3, started um, in Genesis chapter 3 between God and man. If we just turn to uh, Isaiah 59. <clears throat> Isaiah 59 just really describes for us in different words what the problem is, what the conflict is, the issue that separates man and God, the result of that conflict, this is the problem that results, <clears throat> which is, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but, verse 2, your iniquities, your sins, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, this particular context to this passage but that separation then it exists here in Isaiah and existed was was necessary in uh, being an intermediate um, kind of solution to the conflict that exists in between the coexistence of God and man it can't happen because God is right and good and man is not and is sinful God is righteous and what is righteous cannot come in contact with that which is unrighteous. And that is a great conflict which was introduced in Genesis chapter 3 and is here in Isaiah chapter 59. But if we then turn to Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> what is the way in which this most profound of conflict has been resolved? Romans chapter 5 speaks in verse 1 of a peace that exists with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So 
what is this referring to? This is a this this is referring hinting at a removal of this conflict that exists. That there can be a peace, and it happens through Christ. And if we turn on a few uh, chapters to Romans chapter eight, well, we saw in Isaiah fifty nine that the thing that separates, the thing that needs to be removed, for that conflict to be removed is our iniquities and in verse 1 of Romans chapter 8 it talks about the removal of iniquities or or the consequence of iniquities which is the condemnation of the flesh and it says that there is no condemnation there is no judgment from God to them which are in Christ Jesus so there is um, there is there is an acceptance by God that he will not condemn and judge man that are that are in Christ. Why is that? Well, they must have had their uh, iniquities, their sins removed. And how has this happened? What what is what is God's solution? Well, if we turn to Second uh, of Corinthians, chapter five. <coughs> We read about how man and God have been brought back together in verse 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us we pray you in christ's stead be you reconciled to god how has god done this then how has god removed trespasses well he hath made him christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him so Christ God took a man his son who was not a sinful man did not sin and God said well that man because of he has not sinned and lived without sin and then died without sin conquered sin he conquered the uh, the the um uh what's the word the uh the not initiative but um the kind of the desire of sin within himself he overcame that and what god has said then is that on that basis on the basis of christ's (coughs) conquering of sin and his victory over sin then that sin has been put to death in christ and in that way, I am justified. God is justified in saying, well, that needs to happen. Sin needs to be put to death. It is wrong. But it's also not right that that man, that figure, died and felt the consequence of sin. And therefore, God raised him. And God says that on the basis of what this man has done, I am willing to accept that all men can have their sins removed and put to death in this perfect sacrifice if we recognise that this sin that exists within us and that we cannot remove has been borne by Christ, has been carried by Christ. And we accept that we are unable to remove that sin and that we are not right before God, but that that sin has been put to death in Christ as our representative. So this then is the way in which God has resolved this greatest of conflicts by justifying his position in saying we need to remove sin that sin is the problem that exists between man and between um, and between him and that the righteousness of God is upheld in putting Christ to death but that Christ's righteousness is then conferred to uh, all that that make this recognition and say that we cannot save ourselves but that through faith our belief in that salvation that God has brought, we can be saved. So we've seen then uh, this evening that there are lots of different ways in which man um, has tried to and continues to try to resolve the conflict that exists between um, 
our, it, with it exists within our lives. And that there are lots of different examples in the Bible about how God and faithful men seek to resolve conflict, whether it is upholding God's word, whether it is adopting a spirit of meekness and of humility, and that ultimately that conflict that exists between man and God has been removed through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.